of W.H. Auden. Douglas is um, the very, no, I call him the very and the right reverend, but he's the Reverend Dr. Douglas Dupree, and he is the canon for the Bishop's Institute in the Diocese of Florida. So he is right across the street from us at the cathedral. So that's enough from me. Douglas, thank you for being with us. And oh, it's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure. Uh, uh, Zoom makes me feel like the old man that I am <laughs> trying to get used to. It. Uh, the, uh, let me begin with a compliment. Uh, I've been working uh, with the Bishop's Institute, which kind of provides all things educational at the diocesan level, uh, coordinating programs to train local priests and vocational deacons, and uh, recently a, a very fine licensed lay ministry course. And um, I've been involved with it since uh, uh, June of 2015. And I must say, ever since I started, um, the cathedral, St. John's Cathedral, has been a tremendous support uh, for my work in ministry. Uh, your dean, uh, I met with her early on, and she said, we have a lot of wonderful resources at the cathedral. We want to serve not only our own congregation, but um, the, the whole diocese. And so uh, a goodly number of my programs over the years uh, have been held at the cathedral, uh, courtesy of uh, the dean and vestry and all, all of you fine members of the cathedral. So thank you very much indeed. Um, today I want to talk about uh, a poet that I have really liked for many, many years, ever since I was uh, a young college boy uh, at uh, Sewanee, the University of the South. Uh, I majored in English as an undergraduate. Um, I probably would have gone on to do a PhD, except one of my uh, college tutors, uh, Mr. Andrew Lytle, he said, son, don't do that. He said, we've taught you how to read a book and if you go to do a PhD, you'll probably just learn to put footnote on footnote. <laughs> and it'll take all the joy out of it. Uh, so instead, I did a PhD in theology, all the time pining to read more uh, English literature, which, Owen, you had the privilege to do because you've been teaching it for so many years uh, to young, uh, young bright uh, uh, girls and boys. Uh, the poet I'd like to share with you today uh, is the Anglo-American poet uh, W.H. Auden, Winston Hugh uh, Auden. And can we have our first slide, um, Owen? We'll Oh, there we go. Can everyone see that? Okay. Um, Winston Hugh Auden, W.H. Auden, is he? He was the son of a doctor uh, and a very devout uh, Christian mother. Both his maternal and paternal grandfathers were Church of England priests. And indeed, four of his uncles were uh, priests of the church. Uh, so he, he, he was born into and brought up in a, in a very uh, Christian atmosphere. His parents, um, Church of England, Anglican, were Anglo-Catholics. They were high churchmen, bells and smells. Uh, in 1925, he went up to Christ Church, Oxford. Uh, that's the college in Oxford that uh, when Henry VIII abolished the monasteries, uh, he gave a big chunk of the money from uh, the monasteries to, uh, uh, to one, of his, one of his ministers who built this beautiful, beautiful uh, college uh, and cathedral in the heart of uh, the University of Oxford. And uh, 
Auden went up there in 1925 to Oxford to read English. He took his degree three years later. If you get a degree, uh, undergraduate degree in humanities in England, uh, here we take four years, don't we? But there they, you can get it in three years. Uh, he traveled prolifically. I, I guess you could do, let's keep going with slides perhaps. Uh, go to slide, those are my three favorite poets, W.B. Uh, w. Yeats, Eliot, and Auden, but certainly Auden, uh, my favorite. Next slide. Isn't that a face? <laughs> uh, next slide. Uh, he went up to Christchurch, Oxford, and that is Tom Quad in the, uh, in the top color picture. As an old man, before he died, uh, he returned to Christchurch, and the college received him warmly, and they gave him a place to live, um, and he was just available uh, in, in the college to uh, students and to faculty. Um, I matriculated uh, uh, as a graduate in Christchurch, Oxford in 1980, and in 1980s, there were still people around who, who remembered Auden and his presence in the college. Uh, across the street from Christ Church is uh, a very evangelical church, St. Aldate's Church. It's kind of like one of our mega churches in Jacksonville today, you know, where thousands of people go. Uh, very popular with uh, young students. You know, they like the more the merrier, like to pack the church with people. And they had, um, as you'd expect from an evangelical church, they didn't have a bar next to the church. They had an ice cream parlor. And uh, Auden would sit in the ice cream parlor at St. Aldate's uh, during the day and students would drop in and he would give them informal tutorials. They'd have the benefit of this uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful poet. Um, he would say anything. There's an anecdote. Maybe this isn't proper for Sunday, but I'll tell it anyway. Uh, he dined when he Douglas, can you hear me? Uh, you've, he froze again.
Can everybody hear me? Here he comes. There he comes. Douglas, are you set? I've just, for some reason, I get kicked off the computer, so I've gone to my telephone. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm so sorry about that. Um, it's all so, right. Anyhow, to finish the little anecdote about uh, Auden and the bishop, they're sitting at dinner together. And uh, as I said, uh, guest rooms don't have en suite facilities. They just have a little sink in the corner of the guest room. And uh, uh, Auden turned to the Bishop of Dorchester and as a conversation opener, he said, oh, uh, Bishop, uh, you're staying in the Meadows building too. Do you piss in your sink? <laughs> well. I don't think the bishop knew what to do with that, but uh, anyhow, uh, there we go. Okay, next slide. Um, he, after Christchurch, um, he actually started making a name for himself. He was at Christchurch as a poet. He just had a genius gift for language, and uh, he... Um, he, he just traveled extensively. He visited Berlin. Uh, this is in the days when Nazism was just starting to ferment. Um, he taught school in England and Scotland for a while. He visited uh, Iceland. Next slide. Um, he visited Iceland with uh, another poet, Lewis McNeese, an English poet. Um, and then next slide. Uh, oh, wait, I'll go back. Um, he drove an ambulance for the Loyalists in Spain, uh, and then he visited China in 1938 with the English playwright uh, Christopher Isherwood, and that's a picture of uh, Auden and Isherwood about to um, board a train uh, to begin their journey. Uh, in January 1939, he came to the United States and he took out citizenship papers. Uh, uh, over the course of his career, he taught in a lot of different American colleges. He was made uh, a professor of poetry at Oxford in 1955, after the war. Uh, but for all these academic posts, he was primarily a poet, a critic, and also an editor. Um, those of us uh, who love poetry will be familiar with at least some of Auden's poems. Uh, many more will be included um, in the list of people who know his poetry, uh, simply if they saw the 1994 film, uh, Four Weddings and a Funeral. Did any of you see that? Yeah. Uh, in that very popular movie, uh, the actor, mm -hmm. John Hannah Reeves uh, gives a very emotional reading of the poem uh, Funeral Blues um, at the funeral of his uh, dear friend, written by Auden. Uh, so moving, the, you know, a lot of people wept as they um, heard the poem read and witnessed it on the screen. The, the ironic thing, about, oh, can we have that uh, next slide? That shows uh, the actual poem uh, Funeral Blues stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone, um, prevent the dog from barking uh, with a juicy bone. Uh, that poem, which was so movingly read um, as a kind of funeral oration for the death of a dear friend, in actual fact, a song uh, for a play that he jointly wrote with his friend Christopher Isherwood. Um, and it was really meant as a kind of parody uh, on the death of a civil servant, a kind of pompous civil servant. Another autumn poem that I included in the list on the cathedral website is the quite well-known uh, early poem by Auden, September 1, 1939, which was written on the occasion of um, the Nazi invasion of Poland. Uh, that, that poem had a lot of circulation uh, at memorial services related to uh, September 11th in the United States. So a lot of people might uh, 
be familiar with with that poem. It's a beautiful poem. Auden later kind of um, distanced himself from the poem because he didn't think that uh, he expressed truthfully his, his real feelings in it, his, his real thoughts, his, his belief. Um, it's still a beautiful, wonderful poem. Uh, now, if people don't know his poetry, some people may know him by his face. Um, uh, next slide, uh, Owen. <laughs> Look at that face. It's like a road map, isn't it? Um, wrinkled and crisscross with lines. Uh, it reminds me kind of of a bloodhound. Uh, Auden, from a very early age, as I said, he became uh, quite well known as a poet and he attracted the attention of uh, the, the, the fashion photographer Cecil Beaton. Uh, and Beaton photographed Auden over, over many, many years. And through his marvelous photograph portraits of Auden, you can see the advancement and development of that wrinkled uh, face. Uh, in truth today, some people believe that Auden's face was probably the result of a medical condition. Uh, called terrain salant goal syndrome. Um, that kind of ruins the fun of other, other fun theories about how you get a face like, a lived in face like that. Um, he was a man of fair skin from Yorkshire, from the north of England. He submitted his face to brilliant, bright sunshine in the Mediterranean for many, many years, decades. Uh, he lived on the island of Ischia uh, in the Bay of Naples. Uh, not very good for fair northern skin. Uh, he was a man who chain smoked his favorite cigarettes players. Uh, and he was not unfamiliar with uh, a dry martini. So there's a lot to contribute to a face like that. Um, one of his uh, critics or friends, Michael Davidson, uh, saw something symbolic in his face. He said, uh, those singular corrugations or wrinkles are the seismics, seismic result of terrific intellectual commotion. Um, an old friend, Margaret Gardner, she knew him as a young, smooth-faced man before the Second World War. She hadn't seen him in a long time. And then in 1950, when she saw him, when his face was starting to wrinkle up, uh, she was shocked. She was shocked at his face. Uh, she said, unimaginably creased and craggy. She said, it took me some time to rediscover the young face I'd known uh, through beneath the new mask. Uh, then the two merged. And after that, I always saw him with kind of double vision. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, he, he was actually photographed uh, in double vision by uh, Cecil Beaton. So that's kind of interesting comment. Uh, when asked about his face, Auden uh, himself, he simply replied, I guess it's like a wedding cake that has been left out in the rain. Uh, <laughs> oh, bless his heart. Uh, when I was in seminary, um, many moons ago at the Virginia Seminary in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, as a fresher, as a new seminarian, we were all gathered uh, to be introduced to the seminary. The person introducing us and giving us our orientation was the then chaplain, a man called Sid Sanders. And we were all sitting around on sofas in this hall. I can't remember the name of the hall. And he was standing in our midst and um, I think he's actually smoking a cigarette. Can you remember the days when people smoked indoors or smoked at all? Um, and he had the craggiest crease line, W.H. Auden-like face. I remember that was the first time it struck me about Sid Sanders. And I no sooner thought that than he began to talk. Uh, and he said, some of you may be curious about all my wrinkles. They're not from smoking nor from debauchery. Uh, I'd like to think I've earned, earned all these wrinkles over many years trying to be a good and faithful pastor uh, in the churches I've served. 
and in the support I've tried to give to seminarians and their families. I felt rather embarrassed to have noticed his face after he said that. He turned out to be one of the most splendid, splendid, faithful and spiritual priests. Uh, indeed, he became a bishop later, a bishop in Tennessee. Uh, I mention that because behind Auden's very wrinkled, uh, debauched looking face was a very strong, devout Christian. Um, and I would like to turn before we're, we're going to read one of his poems, the Musée de Beau Art, but I'd like to say a few words about his Christian faith and uh, how he came to it. Uh, um, As a boy, as I said, you know, both grandfathers were uh, Anglican priests. His mother was devout. He was devout. And then when adolescence came, as is often the case, it's not that he so much lost his faith. He just wasn't interested in it. He was interested in many other things, but not necessarily the things of the spirit uh, or as they present themselves uh, in religious terms. Uh, so really, when he began to come back to faith, it wasn't, I lost it, now I found it again. It was more, uh, I've reawakened to my faith. And uh, he started coming back to uh, his Christian faith about the time, 1939, the eve of the Second World War, when he immigrated from the United States. And there were several reasons um, for that. Uh, and the first reason, uh, can we have the next slide, please, uh, Owen? Uh, he started attending um, a church near where he lives, St. Mark's in the Bowery in New York. Uh, I don't know New York that well, so I don't know the church. He started going back to church there in that Episcopal church. And uh, went there for about a year, and then after a year, he reaffirmed his faith in October 1940. Um, there were several factors why he came back to faith. Uh, you can really you can read about his faith. There's a beautiful book by Arthur Kirsch called Auden and Christianity, and a lot of my notes that are going to follow um, uh, come from that book. Uh, so if you read the book, you're going, oh, well, Douglas told us that. Well, yes, I'm following T.S. Eliot's dictum, don't borrow steel. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the first thing that made Auden begin to turn to faith was uh, what he called the novelty and shock of the Nazis, uh, the war. The Nazis who made no pretense of believing in justice and liberty for all and who attacked Christianity on the grounds that to love one's neighbor as oneself was a command fit, fit only for effeminate weaklings, not for the healthy blood of the master race. Uh, of the Nazi attack on faith and Christian values, uh, Auden wrote, unless one was prepared to take a relativist view that all values are a matter of personal taste, one could hardly avoid asking the question, if, as I am convinced, the Nazis are wrong and we are right, what is it that validates our, we are right, what is it that validates our values and invalidates theirs? Mm. That got him going on a, a spiritual quest. Um, he also spoke in a newspaper interview uh, of his ex an experience he had in November of 1939. Uh, he was in a movie theater in Yorkville, a largely German section of Manhattan, uh, at the showing of uh, Ziegen Polen, uh, an account, a kind of triumphalist account by the Nazis of their conquest of Poland. And this is what shocked him. He said, when Poles, uh, Polish people appeared on the screen, Auden said a number of quite ordinary, supposedly harmless Germans in the audience were shouting, kill the Poles, kill the Poles. And he said, I wondered then uh, why I reacted as I did against the denial of every humanistic value. The answer, having witnessed that, 
the, having witnessed that, the answer brought me back to the church. Uh, next slide, please, Owen. Uh, a second source of his religious renewal, Auden said, was a visit uh, to Barcelona in January 1937 um, during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, in which he found as he walked through the city that, quote, that all the churches were closed and there was not a priest to be seen. To my astonishment, this discovery left me profoundly shocked and disturbed. I couldn't escape acknowledging that however I had consciously ignored and rejected the church for 16 years, the existence of churches and what went on in them had all the time been very important to me. If that was the case, what then? And as you can see from these uh, two photographs from the time of the Spanish Revolution, the, just the complete desecration of churches that uh, uh, went on all over the country. Um, now, there is a third um, there's a third kind of reason that uh, led Auden back to the church, and this is a more complicated. It's not. It's kind of more complicated because it's more personal uh, to him. Um, the third or final cause of his conversation, uh, Auden said, was that he was providentially forced to know in person what it was like to feel oneself the prey of demonic powers in both uh, the Greek and the Christian sense, stripped of self-control and self-respect, behaving like a ham actor in the string Stringberg play. Now, what was that demonic experience? Uh, the demonic experience to which he refers was his response to the betrayal by his lover, Christopher, Kalman. Um, Auden had met Kalman, an American, 14 years his junior, in April 1939 after his immigration to the United States. Uh, he fell in love, uh, a love he had sought, he said, since he was a child, and had entered into a relationship with him that he regarded as the moral equivalent of a marriage. In July 1941, Kalman revealed that he had betrayed him uh, with someone else. Uh, at some point afterward, Alden apparently put his hands around Kalman's throat while he was sleeping, but Kalman simply brushed him away. Uh, on Christmas Day in 1941, he wrote a passionate letter to Kalman that reveals the extraordinary extent to which erotic and religious imagery uh, became fused in his imagination and, and indeed in his poetry. Uh, in the book by Arthur Kirsch, Auden and Christianity, he includes the letter. Uh, I found it too intimate and personal to feel comfortable. Uh, well, I, I felt it was too intimate for me to read in a way, and I didn't feel right sharing it uh, in a class. But I'll record two lines from it. It will give you an idea of the fusion of uh, erotic and religious Im imagery. Auden wrote, um, thinking of the, the betrayal of uh, Kalman, he wrote, because on account, and this is Christmas morning, because on account of you, I have been in intention and almost in act a murderer at this morning. I think of Herod. I think of you. And then, because I believe in your creative gift, and because I rely absolutely upon your critical judgment, as this morning I think of the Magi, I think of you. Uh, the remarkable letter, it's private, it's confessional. Um, it illuminates the less explicit mixture of Auden's homosexuality with his Christian faith in many of his poems. Um, uh, his great biographer is a man called Mendelssohn, who you, know, you can get six volumes of his work on Auden. Uh, he's collected all of Auden's uh, 
writings, both poetry and prose, uh, and reviews as a critic. Uh, Mendelssohn remarked, he said, at the time that uh, Auden wrote the letter, he regarded marriage, including his marriage to Coleman, as any, quote, sexual relation governed by vows, an ethical and symbolic relation, not a legal and economic one, and one that is, quote, indifferent to the sexuality of the persons joined by it. Now, what does that have to do with Auden refinding Christianity? Um, and it's a good question because Auden actually linked his um, turbulent response to Calman's betrayal of their marriage as one of the principal reasons for his return to the church. Um, and I think it has to do with somehow through the through what he called the demonic. Uh, experience um somehow he came he, he 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 wrestled with himself like wrestling with an angel maybe not a demon but an angel and he wrestled himself to a place where um he he found an acceptance of himself before you can forgive others you some ways you have to forgive yourself he found a, he found a way to accept himself uh for all his gifts for all his warts and he came, I think, through it all to feel the presence of God as a, a loving, merciful, forgiving God and uh, a God who holds us up in his strength. Um, well, there's a kind of happy ending to that story. They no, they, they no longer had an emotionally intense relationship, um, but uh, Auden and Kalman remained uh, great friends for the rest of their lives. and They, they even often lived together. Uh, but more as uh, just two platonic friends. Um, okay, those are some of the, there's another reason, I know I'm, I'm probably getting in the weeds here a bit, uh, that brought Auden to the church, and that was, um, he was profoundly influenced by, you know, when we think of the Inklings or that special group of friends who wrote so many beautiful um, things um, that, are Christian related when we think of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. Well, the third great inkling from that circle uh, is Charles Williams. Does anyone know that name? Charles Williams was a wonderful writer uh, and critic and teacher. And uh, Auden said when he met um, when he met Charles Williams, he just felt he was. He felt like he just like entered heaven. He just entered a room where he felt the sanctity of the person, the, the, the holiness, the spirituality of the person. And, and, and Williams, um, Williams may not have even known it, but he had a great influence on on. Um, okay, let's pause here for a minute because I've been talking so long. Uh, are you still with, are you all with me? Owen? I think so. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, is, am, am I on the right track with what I'm saying and talking about? <laughs> You're doing great. Okay. okay. I, I, I haven't bored the tears and the pants off everyone. I hope not. No. Um, okay. No. Um, Okay, I want to say a little bit more about his faith and before we read the poem, because it's just such an interesting um, Christian faith. Um, you certainly can't pigeonhole his views on religion. In some ways, he's very Catholic, and in some ways, he's very Protestant. Uh, matter of fact, he actually told uh, someone, he said, in each of us, in each Christian, there's a bit of a Catholic and a bit of a Protestant. For truth is Catholic, but the search for it is Protestant. Yeah. And, and he consistently uh, saw the relation between the Catholic truth and the Protestant search dialectically. They're not separate entities, but they're healthily entities that belong together. Uh, and he said uh, analogously and repeatedly, the way 
Christianity, the way rests upon faith and skepticism. Faith that the divine law exists and that our knowledge of it can improve and skepticism that our knowledge of these laws can never be perfect. Now, another big point, we're going to see this dramatically in the poem Musée de Beaux-Arts. Uh, he really thought religion has everything to do with this world. It's not otherworldly uh, in a sense, but uh, despite the appearances of the contrary, the Christian faith, by the very virtue uh, of its doctrines about creation, the nature of man, the revelation of divine guidance and purpose uh, in historical time is really a more this worldly religion uh, than any of its uh, competitors. And he remarked that as opposed to Buddha or Muhammad, Muhammad or Confucius, quote, Jesus convinces me he was right because he forecast our historical evolution correctly. Now, I don't know how to get to the bottom of this, but, but this is what he said, and this is something to you kind of, I guess you could kind of nibble on or uh, grapple with in your mind. He said, if we reject the gospels, then we must reject modern life. Oh, Wayne, that'd be a good question to set your students. If we reject the gospels, then we must reject modern life. Um, he always insisted on the material, the physical, ultimately all the realities and necessities of man's bodily condition in human experience and the proper understanding and acceptance of the flesh and its relation to the spirit as central. Um, he said um, of the relation of, 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 of the spirit and body or spirit and flesh, he said, in a little poem, um, our bodies cannot love, but without one, what works of love could we do? Mm. Uh, he had a strong feeling that man's fallen nature makes faith in God's existence a never ending and difficult quest. Uh, in a letter to a friend in 1944, he wrote, a sinless, a sinless life is like pure art. You must strive for it at the same time that you know it is impossible. And if you forget the impossibility, the life, like the poetry, ceases to be. And then I guess this is a swipe that may appeal to some of you uh, visual art lovers. He says, incidentally, that's why I don't like Mondrian. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, he says, eternity is the decision now, the action now, one's neighbor here. And as you know, for the Christian, the ultimate experience on this side of the resurrection is absolute failure and death. Rather grim. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? The immortality of the soul is a platonic, not a Christian doctrine. Um, now, uh, here's a very interesting thing that I want to share with you. And I think, I think this kind of blends into the poem we're going to look at. He always read the Bible in terms of our time, contemporary time. He, um, he was interested in the biblical events in concrete contemporary times. Um, he always tried to imagine how he himself would have responded to the biblical events had he been there. Mm -hmm. And this was especially true of his conception of the meaning uh, of the crucifixion. He viewed the crucifixion as fundamentally a, a reenactment of a fall. Um, in somewhere he wrote, he, in a passage repeated with a slight variation, and, and he wrote it again. He said, uh, as we were all in Adam, so were we all in Jerusalem. 
on that first Good Friday, when there was as yet no Easter, no Pentecost, no Christmas, no Christians. Who was I, I asked myself, and what was I doing? One of the disciples in a state of spiritual despair and physical terror? Ridiculous. One of the Sanhedrin? No, I am not that a devout churchman. Pilate? No, I am no political big wheel. No, Auden continues, I see myself as a Hellenized Jew from Alexandria, taking an afternoon stroll with a friend engaged in a philosophical argument. Our path takes us near Golgotha. I look up and see a familiar sight, three crosses surrounded by a crowd of onlookers. Really, I say, it's disgusting the way the mob enjoy such things. Why can't they execute criminals quickly and mercifully by giving them, like Socrates, a draft of hemlock? Then, Auden writes, I banish the disagreeable spectacle from my mind, and we resume our fascinating discussion about the nature of the true, the good, and the beautiful. Mm. Mm. Uh, he wrote a series of, little, of poems uh, called the uh, Horae Canonicae, the canonical hours, you know, like the way monks keep um, uh, following the New Testament uh, pattern, praying every three hours, you know, there are different prayers set for uh, the gathering in the monastery every three hours. And following the rhythm of those liturgical prayers, he, he wrote in the same vein of trying to imagine, were you there? You know, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Um, there's one other piece that he wrote, meditating, uh, and I think this plays into our poem very much, um, that he wrote, uh, he, loved, he, he loved to meditate on the incarnation and on the passion of Christ, the cross. He had a lot of problems with the resurrection. He said, "If they just, if the Bible just gave us the um, incarnation and the cross, and I can kind of see that in historical time, I'd be okay." But they're making me wrestle with the resurrection. That was harder for him. But uh, on the cross, he wrote a very beautiful essay uh, where he compares. Um, we have the next slide. Oh, that was the one about his lover, Calum, and all that. Let's, next slide. Okay, there's Auden with the cross in the background. He wrote a beautiful thing where um, he, he talks about the martyrdom of Christ, and uh, he talks about it in relation to other typologies that, that we, we know in, in history of uh, the significance of people dying. Uh, that is, in lit literature, the typology of the sacrificial victim, the epic hero, the tragic hero. Uh, and then there is the martyr. And this is what he writes about the martyr. And I think it's, if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll read a little bit of it. Um, Auden claims on this topic of the, of the martyr that it was Christianity and the cultures influenced by Christianity that first recognized the martyr as a classifiable type. All the so-called higher religions regard one person as their founder and head, but only in Christianity did this person suffer a violent and degrading death. And he goes on to say, uh, this is interesting, if the world now knows that it all times in history and in all places there have been martyrs it is largely christianity that is responsible interesting and he wagers further to say that if any man whatever his beliefs were told the story of two martyrs and asked to say which was the noblest or the purest example of martyrdom his standard of comparison would be based consciously or unconsciously upon the story of the crucifixion. 
He would say, for example, that for martyrdom in its purest form, one condition is that the martyr dies absolutely alone and forsaken, surrounded only by official executioners, enemies, and sadistic or idle, curious spectators. So it was with Christ. Yes, he had Mary, his mother, Mary Magdalene and John, his closest friends, his human friends, standing by the cross. But surely they were there out of loyal affection to the manhood, not in recognition of his Godhead. And before the end, he must endure not only desertion by men, but the withdrawal of his father's presence, total isolation. A second condition, there are three conditions, a second condition is that the martyr's death must be one of extreme agony and physical humiliation in which all self-respect is lost. As Charles Williams has written, our crucifixes exhibit the pain, but Dear. Douglas. Oh dear. Douglas, can you hear us? Converting the world they were to preach to the world that he had risen from the dead, an event for which they could offer no proof. Uh, one other, I'm not, I could go on and on and on. There's so much that's interesting. There's just one other little thing I want to say about Auden's faith, and we'll look at the poem uh, with what time we have left. Orthodoxy is reticence. Reticence. A kind of uh, taking one step back, being a little reserved. Auden wrote that of all the Christian churches, not excluding the Roman Catholic, the Anglican Church has laid the most stress upon the institutional aspect of religion. Uniformity of right has always seemed to be her more seemed to her more important than uniformity. Of Oh dear, the uniformity of wrong. Douglas, I'm so sorry. Well, I, oh, I, has he checked off? Douglas, I guess I could go on to the next slide. Um, can you all hear me? This is, this is the poem, Musée des Beaux-Arts, and... Um, oh, hello. Here he is. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's... Um, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll let you chew on orthodoxy as reticence, but let's go to the poem. Uh, I know I'm taking up too much time, and I apologize for that. Uh, would you put the poem up for us? You've got it up, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Would you read it, uh, to Owen? I will. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position. How it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window, or just walking dully along. How, when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. 
They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The plowman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive delicate ship that must have seen something amazing a boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on well that that's one of um Auden's masterpieces and i would commend to you um if you haven't spent any time with it you look at it um, again. Um, the title of Musée de Beaux-Arts, it takes, the title is from um, uh, a, a visit that Auden made to Brussels and uh, where he visited the, their wonderful uh, Royal Museum of Fine Arts that has all these wonderful, wonderful old master paintings uh, you know, a, a, a lot of the great Northern European old masters like uh, Rembrandt and in the case of this poem, uh, the artist uh, Bruegel. Uh, indeed, the, the, this poem is probably one of the greatest uh, poems ever written on painting. And for our purposes, it shows uh, Alden's intense interest in uh, what I've tried to say before we look at it, um, Auden's understanding Christian history in the context of ordinary existence. And uh, in the first stanza, next slide, uh, we, uh, in the first stanza, the untroubled life of children, dogs, horses, as well as a natural landscape uh, in the presence of the nativity and the crucifixion, uh, appears to evoke uh, this painting that you're looking at now by Bruegel, his painting, The Numbering at Bethlehem. Uh, Auden would have seen that in the Royal Museum. And that's where Mary and Joseph go up to be counted for the census. And that's a dramatic, um, that's a dramatic part of the New Testament narrative and story of Jesus, but it's happening in quite an ordinary looking uh, landscape and setting. Um, children are playing, they're throwing snowballs, adults are doing their everyday tasks, sweeping snow, building a cabin, uh, slaughtering a pig. And he might have also thought of another painting he would have seen in the museum, uh, Bruegel's Winter Landscape with Skaters and a Bird Trap. Next slide, um, Owen. Um, uh, or he also did another, Bruegel did another fine painting called The Slaughter of the Innocents, a village scene in which uh, a host of soldiers are calmly killing children while dogs run and play and horses stand. Uh, tethered to posts. In the second stanza, th this is really something, uh, he describes uh, Br Bruegel's landscape with the fall of Icarus. Can we see that next slide? It'll be our final slide. Uh, and there again, life is just, you know, the, it shows a shepherd calmly leaning on his staff, uh, accompanied by his dogs, surrounded by his sheep, a plowman at work, a fisherman tending his line, a ship sailing unaware close by. Well, in the middle of all that, you know, the great myth of Icarus who flew too close to the sun, he burned his wings and zoom, he fell into the sea. Um, they just go, you know, here, here, here's a guy falling out of the sky and they just calmly go on about everyday things as we do, living our lives in history. And, um, the poem, I get, you know, the poem has everything to do with um, 
Auden's view of how Christianity works in the world, um, dr some really dramatic things, some actually really quite miraculous things are going on around us, and maybe even to us as we continue in the mundaneness and ordinariness of our life. I'm going to stop there because I've gone on too long and I haven't allowed much time for discussion. Um, Owen, I'm going to ask you to kind of um, be our discussion. You, oh, one other thing. Auden was invited to do, take part in a, um, the revision of the American prayer book in, uh, leading up to the 1979 prayer book. Uh, as the kind of poetic consultant to the Psalter, he ended up not doing that, and a splendid man uh, that Oween knows that I, I've met too, uh, who has participated in this series. Uh, and Oween, would you say a word about him and the Alden relationship? Sure. Um, thanks to Douglas, I met Chester Johnson at the cathedral when he was visiting Jacksonville, and he is a friend of our bishops. And um, he, um, Chester Johnson, had uh, written a book called Auden, the Psalms and Me about his experience of working on the Psalms with Auden um, and then actually being asked to take over when Auden decided he just could not face the translation um, out of the Elizabethan English into um, modern day language. And so he left and went back to England. And Chester Johnson tells a wonderful story about being a 24 year old poet in New York City, uh, invited to be, to take on his place on that team that rewrote the Psalms, so. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, we just probably have a few minutes, but uh, I do commend Auden's poetry. Um, Owen, would you lead us in any brief discussion we might want to have? Was, does anybody, we're, we really are about time because church starts shortly, but it's just so fascinating. Does anybody have any comments or any questions for Douglas about Auden, about his story and about, or about his poetry or comments? <laughs> I've invoked a Quaker meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas, can you talk a little bit about what I call the Christmas Oratorio, where the shepherds, the wise men, Gabriel, Mary, Joseph, I'll get these um, voices, um, and then it ends up with this, now it's all over. It's time to take the tree down, and we haven't behaved any better toward our relatives than, <laughs> than before. I think you've pretty much captured it. <laughs> <laughs> what I will what I will mention uh, before we go is another a book that is really fun that uh, has two two chapters on Auden in it. It's just out. It's called Lives of Houses, uh, edited by uh, two two women, Kate Kennedy and Hermione Lee, and it's about the lives, the houses that uh, literary people live in or have lived in oh. uh, under provocative headings like houses lost and found, family houses, dream houses, creative houses, house proud, unhoused, <laughs> the afterlives of houses. Well, that's the end of it. But uh, there is a wonderful essay in it, one about when Auden lived in Austria. And then there's another one about his uh, apartment um, in uh, New York City, which was, he was just a real, bless his heart, slovenly bachelor. Uh, the house would just be covered in trays with cigarette butts and empty martini glasses and uh, <laughs> uh, piles of dust. And anyhow, but that, that's a fascinating book, and uh, I'd recommend it. There's also, if anyone's interested, there's a beautiful, beautiful um, reminiscence in honor of Auden after he died by uh, Hannah Arendt. Um, 
that was featured in the New Yorker. And I haven't shared that with you, but if anybody's interested in it, um, I'll send it to Oween and she can share it with you. Great. Oh, okay, I, I see people leaving, Oween. I guess it's church yeah. time. Douglas, thank you so much. All right, I wish I was in the mountains. I think I'm jealous of Bill and you both. <laughs> <laughs> and pray for us down here if we get a lot of rain. <laughs> I will. I will. God's peace. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.